which mm. actually psychologically will set you up as a trusted advisor. So it'd be like going to a mechanic and you know they're like, my car's not running well. And he goes, well, let's get you a new engine. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And so. Welcome to the Inside Scoop for Outside Sales, the show that dives deep with industry leaders to get you actionable insights to help field sales professionals like you grow and achieve more. Here's your host, Trey Gibson. Hey everybody, it's Trey Gibson, CEO and founder here at Spotio, and you're listening to the Inside Scoop on Outside Sales Podcast. I'm here with none other than Babe Kilgore. He spent his career mastering the psychology of direct sales and building sales companies. He's personally trained over 20,000 yeah, 20, direct sales reps, and today he owns one of the top renewable energy companies in the country. Y'all, he literally wrote the book on non-confrontational sales. I'm excited to dive in. Bay, welcome to the show. Thank you, Trey. Happy to be here, man. So let's start off just back at the beginning. Uh, how'd you get started in sales? Was there anything that that triggered or brought you in for a specific reason? Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, I was the classic like outside, we'll call it direct sales story. So... I had actually applied for a sales job at uh, a jewelry place to put myself through school. Mm. I was kind of on my own a little early uh, with paying for stuff. And I got a full on decline, bro. Like nothing, no hire, nothing. And then a buddy of mine, so just classic story, Salt Lake City, the mecca of door-to-door sales, as, Mm -hmm. as everybody knows. Buddy in Spanish class, talking about going door to door, selling at the time, it was home security systems. And so mm. I tapped this dude on the shoulder, a guy named Jared, and he had coached baseball with my dad. My dad was a, a good baseball coach. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? He goes, yeah, man, I'm going door to door selling home security systems. And I literally laughed. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, and I'm, dude, because I, I grew up in a really safe town in Utah. So like the doors were open, the keys yeah. to my car were left on the seat, <laughs> like no big, and, and then I got, talking to him and I'm like, man, I'd never had a sales job, but I knew if I could learn sales, it would be a big deal in in communication and just business in general. So I took the job going door to door. Mm. And so started off as a rep and then did you progress into sales leadership pretty fast or what what did that that progress look like? Yeah. You know, so, um, I, you know, I was buying a car off my sister, making payments because bro- I, I had very little money. I was doing construction for six years to pay for school. Oh, wow. And even during high school, man, long summer, 78 hours a week. And that's why I wanted to learn sales. But I, I ended up, you know, cutting a deal with my sister. I, I started buying her car. I used the last bit of gas money to drive out to my area for the summer to knock literally the last bit of money I had. <laughs> and, and Trey, classic story. I went the entire first week. The I think the only dude in the office without a sale, <laughs> nothing, man, nothing. And so on uh, on Saturday night after my day of knocking, I went and bought a book, The Secrets of Question Based Selling by Tom Fries, still mm. one of my favorite sales books. Read the book, and the next week sold eleven. Not not like hey, look at me, I sold eleven, but what a change! And it was at that moment yeah. I knew that man, sales is something that you can learn to do. There are no such thing as natural born salespeople. It's a, right. it's a skill you can acquire. So I finished that summer, got into management the next year, then got into doing the regional thing. And then I was training three to 500 salespeople a summer for a couple of summers before I opened up my own company. Wow. And so along that, did you did you come up with this, the, the concept of non-confrontational sales? Like, you know, I, I have a, a direct sales background as well. Uh, and and when people think of of direct sales or in-home sales, the last thing that comes to mind is is non-confrontational, right? Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, like some of the training I went through early on, it's it's about like, you know, being confrontational. So it seems like a a, a new or interesting way of, of looking at it. So how did you, you know, come up with this, with this concept and, and, and uh, did it kind of develop over those years sparked by that, that, that question based approach that you started with? I'm just curious how you got going. Yeah. Uh, great question. So I, you know, I got really obsessive about sales psychology. So I had a weird uh, background for college. I was actually pre-med. Mm. So I actually, I took the MCAT 
the day, and I had my car packed the day I drove out to manage my first team. I actually took the MCAT that morning wow. and drove out and started the next Monday. That was on a Friday. And so I had physiology, anatomy. I had a class called psychoneuroimmunology, which through the mind and the immune system, how does it impact chemistry in our bodies? Mm. And so I had a, a kind of a weird background with science. And as I got into my sales career, I got obsessed with if, if there are truly words and ways in which we can say certain things to produce certain chemical reactions in someone's brain, you can actually guide a conversation with hmm. pretty good accuracy. And so probably around five, six, seven years into my career in door-to-door -door sales, and I'm at about what, 21, 22 years now, I started thinking, how can I really create a catalyst for conversion? And a lot of that was based around I need to find ways to create higher levels of engagement. What I found were people were checked out mm. and more than anything in direct sales, it's so different than retail sales. It's the, the creation of the thought of the product in direct sales is brought from the rep, right? If, if it's retail sales, you want to go buy a laptop, you, it comes into your yeah. brain, you drive down a wall, you buy a laptop. Right. Yeah. In direct sales, then we're creating the thought of the product and it comes with such a history. Trey, it comes with hundreds of years mm -hmm. of bad actors in direct sales that right. have created this fight or flight response for consumers where the second they hear the phone ring, the second you knock on a door or the second you approach a business owner or some other business, immediate walls come up. Right. Immediately, you're down on this emotional bank account way low. And so I, I wanted to develop a way in which we could remove those barriers and create high levels of engagement. That's where non-confrontational sales come out. People, the second you confront in sales is when their norepinephrine, epinephrine triggers, and they put these walls up and they're like, right. get the hell out of here, man. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> so that's where that came from. And so uh, let's talk about maybe some of the, the principles. I know there's uh, reading through the book, communication is, is a obviously the, the core of this, right? The different communication types. So mm -hmm. um, tell me about that. Let's, let's start there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, on the communication side, it really comes down to a single word and it comes down to engagement. So just think about the last 10 or 20 years, what access to information and social media has done to consumers, right? It has equipped them with data and information and the speed at which they can get it. And information is not just shared. Uh, it's not just accessed easily, but it's readily shared. And specifically when something bad happens. And so that's why direct sales mm -hmm. has the last 10 or 20 years has really had to change to be non-confrontational because the advent of social media has expedited this problem where people are like, no. I got, I got 17 people I can reach out to on social media. I looked here and this is about, and so you have to overcome that and break these barriers down with proper communication. Mm. So there's three major communication types that if you want to become really great at engagement, you have to master these. First one, verbal communication. The science of choosing which words to put into your presentation and into your discussion, right? So we all know that certain words will have certain chemical triggers with somebody. And you can say the same sentence a different way and have a totally different chemical mm. reaction. Wow. Yeah, it's. I mean, we know the classic examples. I can come to you and, and my company sells energy efficiency and solar to residential homes. We build power plants for big companies, clean energy power plants. And so mm. I could say to a homeowner, Hey, you know, sign this 25 year contract at 5.99% interest rate and let's save you some money. Or I can rephrase that and say something like, Hey, we're going to repurpose the existing spend. A third party company is going to come in and pay for all of this upfront and we'll lock it in. The rates right now have been really volatile, but these programs are so successful. We can lock your rate in for 25 years at 5.99%. I said the same thing, mm -hmm. but it drives a different chemical response to the consumer. Another thing we had talked about before was the, uh, you know, asking the question, maybe that, oh, that comes, maybe that comes a little bit later, but how you, the inflection or tone, mm. right, of your, yeah. of your voice means so much. And, and, and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that that's a, a, a metaverbal communication technique. So, you know, to, I guess, first, let me round out the verbal yeah, communication yeah. side. So 
the science of choosing those words is critical because every decision we make in life is based on emotions. And when I say emotions, based on literal chemistry inside your brain, literal chemistry inside your brain. It's, it's all people are like, what about the accountant that you sell and the numbers make sense? Like, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. no, the numbers making sense make him or her feel good about it. It's <laughs> right. still emotion, man. Yeah. 100%. So the rest of that verbal communication side is using words like pull words versus push words. Mm. Push word would be something like, I'll use another solar example. Trey, we really need to get you installed so you guys can start saving money and get rebates. That's push. Mm -hmm. In today's world, that, that triggers fight or flight and people push against that. Naturally, they want to push against that. A pull version of that might be something like, let me see if we can squeeze you into the schedule. We've been pretty tied up with appointments I've got one opening tomorrow and one the next day where it feels, you know, there's some herd theory and social proof building yeah. words I'm using. But at the end of the day, man, it's just about being really intentional with your words and having an awareness with your communication. People just write a script and think it doesn't make a difference. Man, are you crazy? It makes a, a massive difference. A massive difference. That's actually what I was going it, to it the the whole idea of a script or or rehearsing or it sounds like to in, in order to have good verbal communication at least repeatedly you're going to have to practice right this is something that is planned out and it's executed is that right do you do you role play do you have this you know this written down in a way that can be consumed by by your team yeah i i actually quiz my salespeople and i'll say hey do i recommend a scripted intro presentation close all of it and half the group's like, no, you got to sound authentic. So no. And I say, I say, no, I don't recommend it. I require it. <laughs> you have, you have to have the information up here in order to then focus on what you're doing while you speak, nonverbal communication and the intonation, speed, volume, enunciation, singular word, enunciation, and stress and pausing. If you can master those, mm. that's where you see these reps that go out and they'll say they're doing three or four or five X. Wow. What a typical rep does is because they've mastered engagement. And again, the words, having it up here and ingrained and memorized is critical so that you can then focus on that feel. And you'd be, you'd be shocked, man. The simplest of stuff, like I, I'll give you a dumb example. If you memorized a different way to respond to a friend, like in, in outside sales, you and me both long time, we're big into recruiting and we're big into lead generation. Mm -hmm. If you had a buddy you, you you hadn't seen in 10 years and you're like, dude, that'd be a killer sales rep. And he calls you on the phone and says, hey, man, I just moved back into town. How you been? What does everybody say? Good. Yeah, good, man. How are you? <laughs> yeah. What, what if you simply retrained your response and you said, oh, I've been good, man. Just really tired, man. I've been working a ton lately. What is your response going to be? I can literally dictate your response 100%. Just been working a ton lately. Yeah, but I'm going to want to come closer to you. I'm going to try to understand that. Understand yeah, why. Yeah, yeah. Literally, 100% of the time, they go, oh, what, what do you do for work? Yeah. And people are like, well, how do you generate leads and get recruits easily without feeling confrontational? It's like, hey, get master verbal communication and say it in a way that's non-threatening. And people will, you can literally dictate responses from people. <laughs> I know it sounds, and I, bro, I don't mean this to sound like some master manipulative plan where <laughs> you control yeah. human oh. beings. Nah, man, it, it, you know, it doesn't work 100% of the time, but I'm talking about people that can three, four, five, 10 X results, lead generation recruits, because they're just aware of what they say. Yeah. Yeah, God, so- on your previous question, though, man, the, the, the two other major communication types, nonverbal communication, spatial zones. Some people still talk too close to people on a first interaction. Mm. Or the close they, talkers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Close dude. I love Seinfeld, man. He's a close talker. She's a close talker. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, it, it's about awareness, body position. If I'm, if I'm shoulder to shoulder with you in a conversation, there is a version of confrontation there. Mm -hmm. You're building a little bit of wall, maybe not massive. A big one is facial expressions and gestures. If this doesn't match what my words convey, I'll produce instantly distrust. Mm. So imagine I meet you, Trey, for the first time. I come to shake your hand. And for those just listening, if I have a scrunchy face and a face of disgust and I shake your hand, I go, Trey, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> my tones are down. My face is like, who, the, who, who is this guy? Yeah. I'll build instant distrust almost 
but not almost way worse than not having a facial expression at all. Yeah. And so the gesture has to match what's coming out of your mouth and match the tones. And then you've got body language as far as posture, appearance, and movement. Some people that sell high-end services don't dress for success. If you've got a big tattoo on your forehead that says death, you know, that's going to cause some issues, but <laughs> there's other things out there that people don't pay attention to, like the way in which you dress. If you're selling particular services, if you sold Harley Davidson's, you wouldn't dress like you sell a software to accounting firms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And, and to just to have an awareness of that nonverbal also includes eye contact and some other categories, but the meat and potatoes of meta, of, of communication types is metaverbal communication. It has the single greatest influence chemically speaking mm. on someone's emotional bank account. And that's so let's, the speed. Okay, go ahead. I was going to ask, yeah, let's, let's hear about that. The speed speed at which you speak intonation. That's that sing songy part of your voice volume enunciation, singular word stress, and pausing. So let, let, let's take the first one, <clears throat> speed. When you go to knock a door or you go into a business for the guys that are, are, are B2C and you go to talk to an owner, what happens, man? You get a little nervous. We all do. I'm, even you've been, I've been doing 21, 22 of years. Still can, <laughs> you still, and your heart speeds up. You release norepinephrine, epinephrine naturally you start to speak faster than you'd normally speak. And that speed creates confusion and disengagement. So if you were knocking a door and you said in a fast tone, I had a couple of questions for the people lived here. Do you own the house by chance? Fast like that? Ah, man, exactly. You're, you're like, you push back. It's like, yeah, like, whoa. Guy? yeah slow down. Patient. Yeah. But if I change that and what I counsel and, and through studies and what it does chemically to the brain is if you speak slightly slower than is natural, hmm. instantly increase engagement. So I, I had a couple of questions for the people with here. Do you own the house by chance? And that tone, that severity, I can get, it's going to sound conceited, I apologize, but out of 10 people that answer, I'll get almost 10 to engage with me at the door. Well, yeah, I even found myself like leaning in right as you were doing that. You know, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm I'm interested. I'm it's almost like I, I'm drawn to that. So I, I can see how it works for sure. Definitely, man. And then you couple that with intonation. So that sing songy part of your voice for new salespeople is probably the most difficult to master, but is the most influential. So you've really got three choices, right? You can either end your sentence structure tones coming up. I had a couple of questions for the people lived here, or I had a couple of questions for the business owner like that. You can end them flat or you can hear tones coming down. I had a couple of questions for the people lived here. And when we get nervous, those tones come up, right? If we ask a question, the tones come up. What people don't realize is intonation is the window to the world, how they view you for your level of confidence. So if you were to take, I, I, I'll give you a dumb example, man. If you were to take um, the president of the United States and let's take Barack Obama as an example. I, I'm not a political person, so we, we won't start that, that dialogue. <laughs> yeah. but, but I think it would be hard to uh, deny that, that he's a good orator. He's a good speaker. Yeah, and, he's, sure. he, and he's been known for that. And you think about the number one attribute of a president is confidence. And you think about how he speaks to the American people. Everything come down to the end. Those huge tones dropping down is mm. massive confidence. Massive. I mean, I mean, imagine take any perfect, take a doctor, take a heart surgeon. Let's say, let's say you and I are, are, are driving out in our outside sales team and mm -hmm. we're stopping by in and out at lunch, man, mm -hmm. grabbing that double, double cheese, <laughs> <style, Sure. laughs> put the works on and dude, after mm -hmm. five, 10 years, man, the heart surgeon comes in mm -hmm. and he's like, babe, you, you need a triple bypass. Could you imagine if his tone was like, babe, we're going to need you a triple bypass. Um, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> you, you know, you'll be in the hospital for three days. Yeah. Well, I would get oh, an alternate man. opinion here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not at all. But these doctors, they've got, they've got all the trend. They've got like a thousand years of school under their belt and yeah. it's a confident profession. It's like, Babe, you need a triple bypass, but you'll, you'll be fine. I've done this over 500 times. It's, it's not a big deal. Those tones dropping down. So as a sales rep, if you can learn to, learn to drop those tones down, you not only show that confidence, which actually lowers, lowers confrontation, 
but it also boosts you as a trusted advisor. Hmm. You instantly gain some trust. Those are probably the two biggest. So what I train sales folks, you know, in our training platforms is slow and low, slow speed, low intonations, drop those tones low at the end. You know, the rest are somewhat ancillary or beneficial to metaverbal communication, like volume. You don't want to speak loud. That's competition. You want to speak mm-hmm. soft enough where they can hear you, but have to pay attention a little bit. It forces engagement. Mm-hmm. The more you singularly stress words in your in your enunciation, the more condescending. You want to kind of roll some of your sentences, and people that talk that way naturally have to kind of kind of work on it. And That's, then the last uh, one's pauses, which is just don't don't pause in the wrong location because a pause is actually a, a version of a close. And so th- that, I, I know I threw a lot out there, man, but that those are the three major communication types that if, and, and again, I can't stress it enough, there is no such thing as a natural born salesperson. You can't, any person on the planet can become extremely good at sales and engagement through awareness, focus, and, and mastering these communication mm. types. Yeah. So when you train new reps, where do you start between uh, those three types? Do you, do you, is there a certain order that you go in that you've found more successful than others? Yeah. You know, um, as much as I, I hate to start with this one, because the lowest influence is the verbal communication side, but they really need to number one, memorize the script. Mm-hmm. So um, as outside salespeople, one of our battles in management and leadership is getting quick success with folks. And so what we know is if people are sharing the right information in the right order, even if their metaverbal and nonverbal communication is not perfect, we know they're going to find some sales out there and deals out there. Mm -hmm. We know they will just through the sheer numbers side. Yeah. And then nonverbal and metaverbal will take 30, 60 days to get really uh, just even an awareness and start getting Mm. good at it. And that's why you see these reps that shadow people and they hear how it's said and they don't realize the change they make, but the change they make, generally speaking, is body positioning and metaverbal tones with some structural change in verbal communication. It's fascinating. We're going to take a quick break and, and we'll be right back with the inside scoop on outside sales. We hope you're enjoying the inside scoop on outside sales. If you want to hear more value-packed content, be sure to subscribe and check us out anywhere on social at Spotio. Now back to the show. All right, we're back. Uh, so, babe, let's say that you've you've got the rep and and they've they've worked through the communication styles and they're at least proficient in it. Uh, what comes next after that? Um, so, I, I train on a highly defined set of sales steps, right? And and so, if you take the communication types, that's like the layering of presentation, but what do they present and in what order? What questions do they ask and in what order? So I train a four-step process that is a bit different than traditional sales platforms might train where they're like, you know, lead generation and, Mm -hmm. you know, they talk about this product and show them the benefits and blah, blah, blah. I've got a little bit of a different version of that based on how today's buyer is. And uh, if it's helpful, I could cover those those four items. You want to go through those Absolutely. steps? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. Um, Let's hear it. Yeah. So n- number one is to ask questions to fully understand the prospect's current situation and to ensure the prospect fully understands their own situation mm. and the pain associated to it. So there's a big key here, though. This isn't like Hey, you know, how come you want to get a new roof if you sold roofs? How come you want to get solar if you sold solar? Or why do you want to change over these insurance policies if you're a company and you sell B2C mm-hmm. or something, right? The key here is to dig deep with questions before you try to solve the problem. And some of that strategy from a verbal communication standpoint might look like, hey, Trey, when you say that you think you might need a new roof. Tell me a bit more about what that means. And so I'm getting them to dig deep into their current situation to fully unravel it before you solve the problem, right? Mm. Too many people, too many sales folks will hear a problem and instantly try to solve it. Are you right? Yeah, yeah, man. My utility bill is too high. Yeah, that's a perfect reason to go solar. No, that's not the (laughs) question you ask, man. It's, it's, hey, uh, tell me what you mean by too high. Okay, are you seeing that all 12 months? 
I see. And what did you expect that should be? I'm just digging deeper to fully unravel. So that should be a, a decent portion of time on the intro steps because not only are you understanding their situation, helping them understand their own situation, but you're doing what's called a series of diagnostic questions, hmm. which actually psychologically will set you up as a trusted advisor. So it'd be like going to a mechanic and you know they're like, my car's not running well. And he goes, well, let's get you a new engine. You're like... What? <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. And so it, what the technician does, man, is he goes through, asks a bunch of, what are you, are you hearing noises? What are you, is it driving well? And tell me this bunch of diagnostic questions. Then when they bring that report out to you and show you need, you need a new engine, you're like, yeah, looks like, dang, man, this is the engine horrible, is. but I need a new engine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, horrible news. So that's always step one. And you don't, you never skip the step, no matter how prepared the customer feels to you. You always mm. go you never skip a step. Number two, we're going to develop the existing pain of their current situation. What happens if they don't do anything about their situation? How bad does it get? Most of us as outside salespeople, we focus on just the benefits, mm -hmm. just, the, just the benefits. But this concept we call loss aversion, it's chemically more powerful literally chemically in your brain more powerful for human beings to avoid a problem than to gain than to have financial gain hmm. you got to think about natural selection and evolution human beings have survived by not dying off like that. <laughs> right yeah it's literally, <laughs> literally ingrained into our dna and so people are much more chemically motivated which means emotionally motivated hmm. to move forward the product or service if it not only provides them benefit, but more motivated than the benefits is if it helps them stop a problem or avo avoid a large problem. That's loss aversion. So the key is pain of the current situation and loss aversion increases your value of services and offerings without feeling salesy. Mm -hmm. If they understand how bad the problem is, and how bad it would get if they don't fix it, your offering instantly becomes more valuable regardless of price and regardless of benefit. So that's how we set the stage is those first two steps. Then we go to three, we ask questions to fully understand where they want to go using results-based language, where we can widen the gap of where they are today and where they want to go. Hmm. So I'll give you another, I'll just make up another dumb example, but I'm in the solar industry, so I'll use a solar example. So if somebody is talking about solar, instead of being like, yeah, you can probably see why, you know, going solar makes so much sense. Using results-based language is giving them the end result. So you change their perception about the product and about the process. So, okay. So Trey, that makes sense. I appreciate you sharing that with me and why you agreed to the original appointment. It looks like you're really hoping to lower your utility costs, save money, regain control, of your power, right? And not have all those constant rake heights from the utility. Am I understanding your long-term goals there? Or is there maybe more to that? Anything else that would be helpful? So I'm using their results they want to mm -hmm. confirm their own results. And then um, it, it's kind of interesting, but I'm using what's called permission-based language, right? Is there possibly more to that? No, I mm -hmm. think you got it. That's exactly, and they're then starting to confirm their own decision to move forward with you. Nice. So that step three is, is widening that gap, use results-based language, where they're at today, how bad it is, where they want to go. They know now, Trey, you fully understand where I want to go. You get it. It's called tactical empathy, right? I, you understand how bad my problem is and you know where I want to go. Then finally, finally step four, which most people do in step one or two, finally step four is you can walk them through your product or service and how it applies to their specific situation using qualification language and really mm -hmm. the opposite of assumptive selling techniques. So um, I don't wanna overcomplicate this, right? But in this step, you should by now have established yourself as a trusted advisor. Right. In that language is baked in what's called herd theory and social proof. So the language is about how Lots of people are doing this. They feel comfortable about it. I want to always encourage outside sales reps to do a step that everybody's like, why would you do that? <clears throat> and it's you gain trust in the final step by telling them specifically something they don't need that you offer. 
something they don't need that you offer. I call it self-deprecate on your products. It sounds horrible, Trey. So <laughs> yeah. Not as bad as it sounds. I'll, I'll give you an example. <laughs> if you came in to buy a Honda Accord from me, and I worked at the Honda dealership, right? And there's a, a red Honda, a white Honda, and a green one. If I pulled you aside, I said, Trey, let me just be straight up with you. The, the white Honda, it had an accident. It mm. hasn't hit the car factory report, but they brought it in as the accident. We already fixed it. We have to file it still. I know it's priced well, but I would not. I'm just telling you off the record, I would not buy that car. Mm. Now, the black car, that was driven by an 81-year-old woman. We did all the service logs. Mm. It's very well priced. That one is super well taken. Because I told them what not to get that I could have sold them, I instantly gained trust Absolutely. on what you know, on, on everything else they quote unquote should get and that will help solve their problem. So find in your, uh, this is to all the sales reps out there, find in your presentation, one product or service you can intentionally tell them not to get that's quote unquote off the record. That will build trust. That's great. Um, and then the last part of, of that fourth step is in today's selling environment, the customer needs to feel in control. You can't jam product or service down their throat anymore. You need to use permission-based language. And that's language like, would it be okay if I reviewed your utility bill with you? Would it be okay if I showed you photos of the roof? Would it be okay if I showed you what the underlayment looks like? That's mm -hmm. permission-based language. Would it be okay if I pulled up my calendar to see if we might be able to fit you in? That lets the customer feel like they're in control. And no one's going to be like, you know what, babe? No, I'm not okay <laughs> yeah. to show me those photos. Every, everybody yeah, yeah. And then the second part of that is, you need to get really good at a concept called mismatching. If you want to feel non-confrontational, get really good at mismatching. That, that's actually how I got my wife to go out with me on a second date. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I, I Not only for sales, for the dating, people looking for a spouse out there. I like it. <laughs> don't, don't, yeah, I hope my wife's not listening. But um, mismatching is simply this. Because of our human nature, where we identify ourselves somewhat with drama, chemically speaking, right? If, I, if I'm uh, talking to a buddy and I tell him, dude, I freaking love to mow the lawn, he's going to instantly say, dude, I hate it. To <laughs> that same person a year later, I'm like, dude, I hate mowing the lawn. Like, dude, it is kind of relaxing for me. <laughs> I know it's bizarre, but that's how, our, that's how our minds work. So it's where you intentionally push something one way to get a response on the other. So in an application for, um, let's take solar again, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of reps will be telling... Um, a customer like, hey, you're going to be amazed at how much money you can save. This is going to be outstanding. It's awesome. And then by the time they get to the savings and they're saving mm. you know, 40 grand over 25 years, it doesn't feel as great because you built it up so much. You're right. So like that story with my wife before our first date. So a buddy of mine's like, dude, you got to take this girl out. I'm like, hey, give me some time. And then a totally separate buddy's like, no, hey, you got to take this girl. It happened to be the same girl. I'm like, okay, let's do, let's do this thing. Yeah, give me her number. <laughs> I text her and I saw, and not to sound all stalker, man, but I totally pulled her up on, on social media. And I'm like, dude, she is smoke on. She is. My wife is a freaking dime. She is hot. <laughs> like the, she is the most beautiful person in real life I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And what I did before the date was I said, hey, just so you know, when I come to your door and you can recognize me, let me send you a picture. I don't want you to be you know, afraid of, of what I'm going to look like. Mm -hmm. Trey, I found the ugliest dude on on the online that I could find. The ugliest dude, man. I sent her a picture and I left it at that. Left it at that. And then when I got there, what'd she say? She goes, <laughs> she goes, oh, he's actually not that bad. She just pushed it one way and then she sees it. Oh my God. And that's the exact same principle in a sale. So in the solar example, instead of you're going to save 40 grand, it's going to be awesome, blah, blah, blah. I actually train her up and say, hey, you know, there's a lot of crazy notions out there that you can save a bunch of money and, you know, buy that second house in Hawaii. The savings are not that that great. You are helping the planet. It is, it is good. You know, over 25 years, you're going to pay off your entire system. And then on top of that, you're only going to save about $44,312. So again, it's not that second house in the, in Hawaii. It's only about 44 grand. And every person, every person, almost word for word goes, you kidding me? 44 grand? That's a ton of money. <laughs> yeah. It's real money. You know, it's better than giving it to the utility. But that's non-confrontational sales using, you know, the right vocabulary or the right intonation where they say, wow, that's way. So you're not pushing people into it. You're right. pushing them through it with, with the right process. So those are the four 
big steps. We added a few items in there, man. I apologize. I went a little long on those, but hopefully that's helpful. That's extremely interesting. And we uh, here at Spotio, part of our sales process is also getting down to what we call pain. And, and that's for us, you know, we sell a, a sales productivity type software. So it's typically around, you're not hitting your sales goals or they need to grow faster, or, you know, whatever it might be. But that's, you know, I've seen our reps and me personally trying to do that struggle to actually get to, to real pain for your step like two, how do you know when you've, when you've kind of gone deep enough or how, how, how do you, how, how far do you go down to into that pain with when you're, when you're there with your, your prospect? So when you're asking questions about how to elaborate on that pain, it's not, um, it, it's actually kind of like this, you don't actually hear it obviously, but there's like an audible click where you can tell they get it. And so, you know, so, so, so take, take the, the solar example and you say, so with rates rising at four, four, you know, 4% on average a year, and sometimes higher based on the population growing, what happens if that bill gets up to seven, eight, nine, eight, you know, hundred, maybe a thousand dollars a month. How, how does that impact your lifestyle? And like, oh man, we can barely afford it now. Okay. So that would, that's a pretty big problem. And so that, okay, that, that helps to know that we want to definitely take care of that. So once they kind of click and they go, that's a huge problem. Like that's mm -hmm. really painful for me. You know, you've now developed it enough to say, you know what? That's helpful. I, I think it will make sense to look at a system. I've, I can do the design here right with you now. I've got a basic design pulled up. Let me walk you through to see if that might make sense and we can solve that problem for you. And that's how you know. It's just they, they, they kind of click and get it. Nice. That's good. I wanted to switch gears a little bit. I know sales culture is really important to you and, and at your company, that's something that, that y'all are really proud of the culture you've built. So what, what is a, what does a good sales culture look like? Like, what does it feel like? Like if I go into any company and, and, and uh, I, Oh, that's, they have a good sales culture. Like what am I experiencing? You know, probably a couple of things. I, I think there are critical, critical components of creating a, high performing culture and a culture of family mm. and by family. I really mean a culture of trust. Yeah. For most people you can count on family. I got to move. I call my dad. I know my dad's going to be there when he says he's going to be there. Right. There's this culture of trust inside of family because you have each other's backs as a family. And if you don't, what I really want people to understand in management, if you don't intentionally create a culture, one will be created for you, whether yep. you like it or not. Absolutely. So you may as well be intentional about how that looks. So a couple key components. Number one is you've got to make goals, expectations, the vision, transparent, simple, and easily defined, mm. right? Reps, reps, sales reps, outside sales reps quit for five main reasons. And I pulled this from a guy named Ben Ward, awesome sales trainer. Lo love the guy, personal friend of mine. He says they quit for five reasons, unmet expectations, by far number one. They will quit because they have unmet expectations, poor training, poor support, poor connection to the organization and people, and then acts of God and life changes. Number one mm. is bigger than the next four combined. Unmet expectations. Uh, so how often do you sit down with a sales rep, a manager, a team leader, and say, here's what I'm expecting of you. Here's what you can count on in return. If any of this feels misaligned, you have the power and the voice to come to me. Let's make sure we're always in alignment on expectations. Mm. It's rare, man. So that's number one is creating that kind of vision and and uh, nice specific, right? Very specific pathways. So number two is you've got to enable your people to take ownership, guide them into coming up with their solution. Hey, what happened yesterday? It looks like you didn't close those two deals. What did you feel happened? Is there any training you'd like to focus on? We mm -hmm. get so many people up there, man. They stand up there. Hey, you got to sell three today. And you're like, how? <laughs> yeah. but we got to empower salespeople to take ownership of their own personal progress. Cause if they don't, we've seen it a million times. Mm -hmm. How many times went to a rep and they're like, uh, I didn't make, I didn't make the money. I thought, man, they ripped me off. And we know great companies where they'll say that about a great company, Absolutely. Yeah, but it's because they create this victim mentality. They don't let the rep take ownership mm. of their own sales progression. So you've got to help them discover how to help themselves. Three, you have to give relevant data. This is why Spotio is mm -hmm. fantastic, man. It is, I'm a data whore. I love <laughs> data, man. <laughs> if you can give them relevant data to help their situation and help them make better decisions, mm. 
That is key to retention because they know what to do to fix the problem. Four, define the measures of accountability. When you want something done from a sales rep, who, what, and by when. Mm. I need you to do this and work with this department to complete this. Who does it? What are they doing? And by when, right? Does your team know what the first 12 weeks look like of their first 12 weeks in your company? If you've not defined that, you've got to define that. Mm. Five, use varying strategies to motivate and develop your reps. Go to where each rep is. You're not going to develop a rep that's yeah. high producing, doing three, four, five accounts a day, whatever industry you're in, to a guy doing one a week. Different training strategies, different methods. Lead from the front is number six, right? On accountability. Honor your word. If you say you're going to do it, do it. That is right. that is such a big freaking deal. Build that trust and, too, yeah. Yeah, man. The number seven is you have to have a culture of execution. Follow through on the process that's laid out. Give people the gift of completeness. We're salespeople. We have a history and we've been conditioned over time to do the oral report uh, in school the next morning. We're up at midnight just reading through it because we know we can wing it the next morning. <laughs> yeah. Half acid and do okay. You can't run a sales culture that way. Yeah. Give what I call the gift of completeness. If you're going to do something for someone, prepare it all the way. Put it in a freaking bow. Mm. Take it all the way to the top and then give it to your rep. Here's the training I produced for you. It's three pages long. It's got his exact scripting down, the stuff he need, or she needs to adjust exactly when you're going to check in and give them the gift of completeness. That's execution. So you, you have an awareness about the culture, implement these seven steps. I'll promise you, you'll create a culture of performance and a culture where people love working for you. Mm. That's fantastic. <clears throat> Boy, we've covered a lot. Like this has been just packed with nuggets of awesomeness. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, if if the listeners want to to learn more or you know find out how to to put this in place in their companies or what's the best way to do that or get a hold of you, babe? Well, my email is just babe at nerdpower.energy. I love helping sales platform, sales psychology. Any questions, let me know. I, you know, I just actually started to a uh, a couple of weeks ago, an Instagram page. I'm getting one sales tip a day. It's under non-confrontational sales. Mm. One video a day. If you improve by 1% a day, that's all you need. At the end of a year, you will be a master in sales communication. Give it a follow. I don't sell anything on it. I'm not trying to make money on it. I don't do ads or anything like that. It's just mm. literally just to help. But happy to do that. Uh, and I love doing it, actually. It's fun for me. That's fantastic. And also you do have a book on non-confrontational sales that, that I recommend. I have it. Um, and it's, uh, includes those, many of the things that we talked about today. So babe, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and experience with me and the rest of the listeners. Uh, and, and thank you for that and, uh, wish you nothing but success in the future. Thank you, Trey. And thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Buddy. Take care. Absolutely. Talk to you later. You've just listened to the Inside Scoop on Outside Sales Podcast with your host, Trey Gibson. Please feel free to leave us a review and subscribe to our channel so you can catch our next episode. Thank you for listening.